Welcome to this special edition of Thought to Action presented by the London Center for Policy Research. This is the first in a series where we discuss the threat communist China and the CCP pose to its neighbors, the US, the West, and the rest of the world. Please feel free to comment on this video. We'd like to hear what you think. Also subscribe to our channel and hit that bell. You can also see what we're up to on the website, londoncenter.org. And of course, please share this video and spread the word. Share it with your friends, colleagues, and on all your social media. I'm Chris Cordani. I'm in the host chair for today. Our panel will be looking into the immediate threat that communist China poses to nearby island nations, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Today, we have the London Center for Policy Research President, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Tony Schaefer, London Center Distinguished Fellow Navy Captain Retired Pete O'Brien, and Claudia Rosette, Foreign Policy Fellow at the Independent Women's Forum and Fellow at the Hudson Institute. Thank you for joining us. China has come down hard on Hong Kong after several citizen protests and consistently laid claim to Taiwan to the point where a professional wrestler whined an apology for referring to the latter as its own nation. Combined with what is perceived as weaker Western leadership, the threat China mounts to Taiwan and Hong Kong is mounting. So let's start here and discuss exactly how much of a threat China is to these island nations. Tony, let's start off with you. So I think uh, the fundamental requirement for the Chinese issue is understanding where China is coming from. China is no longer so much a communist nation, but a nationalistic nation. And what I mean by that is that China has for decades made it very clear that it's desiring, its, its objectives are to continue to increase its influence through, through the Pacific Rim. And uh, we did a, a red team review on behalf of a major corporation a few years ago in the former think tank I was at. And the conclusion we reached is China is going to continue to expand out to the, uh, to its uh, logical conclusion, which is their boundaries uh, of old, their old dynasties. Uh, they think that their law is older than ours. They think that their society is older than ours. What gives uh, us the right to tell them what their boundaries are going to be? And therefore, if you examine this through that lens, what they're doing makes great sense. Uh, regarding the current tactics and, and where they're going, again, this is something we've not, uh, we've not been um, ignorant of. Uh, since not the 1990s, uh, uh, distinguished fellow Pete O'Brien and I have both been planners against uh, China militarily. And we recognized then that the, China, that the trends of China moving in the expansionist direction using both soft power and building up its military was a trend that they were not going to back off. And when you look at their society and the way they look at, uh, at, at time, they are well within their schedule. Uh, we see things in two and three and four year cycles they th see things in, in, uh, in chunks of generations. So uh, I think we need to re-attenuate our view of them to properly understand what their actions are. I would argue politicians in the West have yet to do that. I agree with all of this. Uh, and I would add that I think China is even more ambitious than that these days. If you listen to what Xi Jinping says, the the president, the head of their communist party, the tyrant who now has eliminated all term limits such as they had on his rule and is sort of leading China toward this world dominant position as he envisions it. Uh, the goal is to run is to run the world basically. Uh, that's the Belt and Road which extends into Europe, to Latin America, to uh, that's what you see in their diplomatic efforts. It's what you see on many, many fronts now. And it is very important to understand this is the Communist Party of China, which is just over 90 million people in a country of 1.4 billion and rules China in what I would now call a totalitarian system. Um, it's important to understand just how ruthless and cruel this party is because that's what's proposing to lead the world order as the 21st century goes on some of the key dates, they look at 2030, which is the UN quote, sustainable development agenda when they have a set of goals to be met, which they're shaping. Um, there's 2049, the anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And they love anniversaries. They're, you know, about to, they're busy right now with 
celebrations of the 100th anniversary of China's Communist Party, one of the most damaging organizations to emerge over the past century and the worst damage emerging right now. So uh, there's a very big problem we really have to deal with. Ignoring it is not going to fix it. The Chinese, and, and, and when I say the Chinese, part of that is the entire, uh, if you will, culture, but but in particular, the, uh, the leadership of the Communist Party uh, and the, the tight little group of, of uh, uh, folks right around uh, uh, Xi. And, 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 and really, we should call him Emperor Xi. He, he is an emperor in everything uh, uh, but having a, a assumed the title. Um, but uh, the perspective of China as the heartland or the middle kingdom, if you will, of the of earth of humanity and, and it, it is the center uh i think it's something it, it's a good image to stick in your head they, there is a there is a very real perspective i've i've seen uh, uh reading uh, uh various uh, chinese authors and, and uh folks from uh experts like like claudia uh is that is that they do view themselves as as uh, the rightful centers of uh of uh, civilization uh, but I'd also that you should lay on uh, on top of that a few uh, a few thoughts uh, uh, theses, if you will, that have have uh, developed over the last uh, 100 150 years. I would throw out McKinder's Heartland theory. Doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the folks at the center of the Communist Party in Beijing think it's right uh, that uh, controlling, uh, if you will, uh, Asia or the heartland of Asia. Uh, is essential to controlling all of Asia and by extension, to follow the theory, the whole planet. And if you then go look at uh, Mahan's uh, uh, thesis in um, the problem of Asia, which actually predated McKinder by about a year, uh, Mahan's thesis on the heartland of Asia is that uh, the country that controls the ends of Asia, and he defined the ends as the Suez Canal on one end and uh, Singapore on the other, uh, can essentially put a stranglehold uh, on Asia. And if you look at uh, the maritime strategy of uh, the Chinese right now, they are endeavoring to execute uh, Mahan's plan. So you, you kind of put all these little pieces together, kind of look at ev everything that they're doing, uh, and then you add on top of it uh, that there is no sense uh, of, the, of what we in the West view as morals uh, putting any kind of governance or governor on the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and, you know, that's your starting gate uh, and they're off uh, and they intend to execute. So uh, as we look forward here, we can expect that they're going to keep doing that. And you can throw in that one final coin. Xi wants to done on his watch. He wants to be the man. He wants to be the guy that did the whole thing. He wants to be the guy that brought Taiwan home after what, uh, I don't know, 80 years by now, right? Uh, it's World War II. 70, 80 years, yeah. Let's get into this, though. We cannot have a discussion about this and the aggression towards Taiwan and, Hang and Hong Kong without mentioning the cruelty of the Chinese Communist Party, especially as shown in recent events in Hong Kong. We have to also add the plans President Xi undoubtedly has for achieving his goals and the rationale for his for, for lack of a better term, methods. Let's uh, talk about this and let's go with uh, Claudia on this first. Yeah, if I might say a personal word, I love Hong Kong. I have loved that city since I saw it when I was growing up. I went there and worked there for the Wall Street Journal for from 1986 to 1993 under British colonial rule and then went back every chance I could get, including two years ago, to cover their protests. And uh, what happened there was immensely important because in the 21st century, I cannot think of a more clarion articulate call for freedom than what we heard coming out of Hong Kong two years ago. They really understood it. Whatever is going on with woke America, Hong Kong was a place, this little place of seven and a half million people where this culture without great big grants and aid programs had developed that really understood democracy and freedom and why it mattered and they said so and they really put their necks on the line and some of them are now paying a terrible price. And China promised when the British handed over Hong Kong in 1997, China had already signed on to 
a binding international treaty deposited with the United Nations to respect Hong Kong's accustomed rights and freedoms for 50 years after the handover. That meant free speech, freedom of assembly. They promised that there would be the chance to really elect their own representatives, all these good things. And what they began then, China then began eroding that. The Communist Party does not coexist happily, easily, or long with any kind of freedom. It was not a surprise, but the way it played out has been monstrous. And Hong Kong, at the point where all these things were being compromised with this creepy, sneaky law that was going to allow extradition to China two years ago, proposed by the ghastly chief executive installed by Xi Jinping in 2017, Hong Kong rose up and said, no, we want what we were promised. We want the rights that, in fact, whether or not they were promised them, are the rights of all mankind. They had, they went, it was incredibly heroic. And then China sort of let them come, let them come, took down names, made lists, and is now just destroying all that. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic, which came from China, became the pretext for shutting off Hong Kong from the world. As of a year ago, March, non-residents simply couldn't fly in there unless with special dispensation. This was the world crossroads of Asia, the busy, amazing hub for generations. And suddenly you couldn't even get in. Um, and what they've done now, the big news that you probably saw in recent days is one of Hong Kong's many amazing voices for freedom, for democracy, was a man named Jimmy Lai, who came as a young, as a boy, smuggled aboard a fishing boat from China to Hong Kong with nothing, made his fortune, founded Giordano's clothing, and then translated his fortune into publishing a newspaper, Apple Daily, which was an amazing voice for freedom and a rather wonderful tabloid coverage of human affairs as well. It, it provided gossip you didn't always get elsewhere. But uh, he was and he was one of the most eloquent out there voices saying China needs to honor its promises to Hong Kong. We need freedom, we need democracy, we need all these things. Well, um, they arrested him as the whole coronavirus cover went on. Uh, he's been in prison since December. He's facing, he's now serving sentences for the crime of having get, part, taken part in an illegal assembly, a demonstration I was at that demo, one of the things, I was at that demonstration. It was entirely peaceful. People brought their children, but it was illegal in today's Hong Kong. And China just shut down his newspaper, which is a horrendous thing. That was something you could find all over Hong Kong, Apple Daily. And uh, they did it by freezing the bank accounts. And now I just want to get to the cruelty. They did it after all this horrible in your face refusal to compromise, to negotiate, to do anything for the people in Hong Kong who are risking so much to saying, keep your promises. And what's now happened is Apple Daily was shut down by having its bank accounts frozen. They couldn't pay for anything. They had to shut down. They did that last Thursday. And uh, the security secretary, the security chief in charge of that, who was sort of in, con who handled the shutting down of Apple Daily, not to mention the arrests, the suppression of the protests two years ago and last year, all these things. A man named John Lee was promoted right about the same time to become the second most important executive in Hong Kong, the chief secretary, the top administrator under the Beijing appointed chief executive, Carrie Lam. Of course, he had to be approved by Beijing. This was something where Americans probably won't be noticing this. I mean, who's John Lee? But for Hong Kongers, it is, it is a brutal, in your face, bullying, brutalizing insult. It takes the man who has crushed their freedoms, stripped them away with his horrible national security laws, Orwellian stuff, and it makes him the time. In fact, while Carrie Lam, the chief executive, is on her way to Beijing to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party, John Lee, who engineered the shutdown of Apple Daily, is now the top, the chief executive, acting chief executive in Hong Kong. Why am I telling you this long tale? Because I think what it illustrates very well is that 
China isn't simply China's Communist Party. I like to distinguish between that and all of China. <laughs> it's not in the business of simply silencing and censoring. It's in the business of brutalizing people, of destroying them, of breaking the will of these movements. And that is something Americans really keep need to keep in mind. Part of the point of China's propaganda for us is to do precisely that. And if you want to see how it works when it plays out, look to Hong Kong. It's, it's truly horrifying. It's barbaric, frankly. The thing we need to remember here is this is a, uh, a government which has uh, imprisoned uh, at least a million, uh, probably well more than that, uh, Uyghurs uh, uh, in northwestern uh, China. Uh, they, they engage in harvesting human organs uh, in your told to volunteer, as it were, um, to the tune of tens of thousands of, of organs a year. Um, it, you know, there's, there's just, it, it's a level of, of uh, evil, is the only way to, well, word to, to use, uh, that, that is hard to get your head around. If you just simply stood up and said, hey, you know, the government of X is killing several thousand people a year on order from the government in order to sell their organs. Uh, it, it's too fantastic a tale uh, to even make a movie of the week with. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the Chinese government is doing that. President Xi's government is doing that. And it should make the entire world recoil, but that's who we're dealing with. We're sitting on our hands, not responding or preparing properly. A loose metaphor, I look at Hong Kong as uh, Berlin and the Soviet US standoff in many ways by the fact that Berlin was the canary in the coal mine of what was coming. And uh, we have, I think, recognized the importance of Hong Kong and the lack of Western resolve to defend democratic uh, principles. Uh, the British especially, I'm disappointed the British uh, were so naive or uh, reticent, not sufficiently reticent to recognize the dangers that China posed to the democratic uh, processes of Hong Kong. And one of the things that uh, Pete and I have uh, advised the last administration to include several high ranking officials, very high ranking officials, is the need to come up with a grand strategy which accounted for China's continued uh, wrongdoing and aggression at the tactical level down to what Claudia is talking about up to the strategic level and, and major uh, alliances we must be forming. And I would argue that uh, one of the things that we must do is actually examine the region for natural allies. India is the largest competitor, and by the way, a democracy, which we should be uh, heavily working with. Our old adversary, Vietnam, is another organ uh, country that is a natural ally. Uh, the Australians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, these are all nations which hold dear uh, the principles we do regarding uh, free trade, free ideologies, free discussion. And these are the things that we should be building right now, a coalition, a NATO type coalition to prepare for the inevitable conflict which we see coming with China. And at the same time, we have to be much more active and aggressive to counter what they're doing to Hong Kong. Uh, I never thought I would see the day where the United States would essentially turn a blind eye in the form of Joe Biden and the current administration to ignoring completely the slave labor, the brutality uh, that's being perpetrated by the Chinese government, by the, 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 the Communist Party. And remember, uh, I had to mix my metaphors here, but uh, you had in Germany, Nazi Germany, a, uh, a nation which used a military force uh, as well as a an armed political force. You had the Waffen SS and the Wehrmacht. And so the Chinese in many ways are uh, mimicking something that worked very well by other totalitarian regimes where you have an official state uh, and, a, and a party, which that which is is commingled to the point of where the state becomes the party, and what the party wishes, the state complies with, and so this is what we're faced with at this point in time. We cannot ignore this uh, by the fact if we continue to ignore it, uh, our interests and the interests of our allies will fail within the next twenty years. And and just a, one final thought, now, uh, Chris, is that uh, the the Communist Party in China has been every bit as vicious as the Nazis. They were perhaps not quite as, as organized in the Nazis' uh, uh, bizarre, fanatical, uh, but, but uh, disciplined and, and structured uh, 
uh, persecution of, of the Jews and others, but they have been at least as vicious. And if you look at the body count that the, that the Communist Party in China is responsible for, it dwarfs what, what, uh, what the Nazis did. Pete, let's uh, lead off with you for this round too, since, uh, since you're, you brought this point up. Communist China's leaders have been a bit more aggressive verbally and even uh, in, in other ways in the past year against Taiwan and Hong Kong. If they haven't moved on these nations over the past few decades, what, why now, or what would allow them to do so now, or perhaps after the Olympics, like some experts speculate? Well, I, I, would, I would give you a couple of, uh, of points here to consider. One of the reasons why they haven't moved on Taiwan in the past was because they clearly didn't have the capability. Uh, the, the, without question, the most difficult uh, military uh, uh, action, uh, large-scale military action around is a large-scale uh, amphibious assault. And uh, crossing the 100-mile wide um, uh, Strait of Taiwan uh, with a sufficient force to uh, seize, uh, seize the island, um, that is a, uh, to use the jargon, a non-trivial event. That, that, is, that is going to be a very difficult uh, operation, even under the best of circumstances. Ten years ago, they did not have the military capacity to do it. Do they have the military capacity today? It would be, I would say, strictly speaking, probably not, but they're right on the edge. Um, if, if the Taiwanese were to put up a hard fight, if they had fought the right weapons, did the right things, they can make it very, very painful. But uh, so there is, a, there is a capabilities issue that you're now reaching the point now, last year, this year, next year, someplace in that time, I would submit that the that the, the the professional officers in Beijing, someplace in there in that in that time frame, either have said or are now about to say, we can probably execute the plan. Now uh, that's because you can doesn't mean you do. One of the other things is that you know the, there's a great line from Napoleon: "Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake." Uh, the the West has been making a whole series of them uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, several months. If I were uh, advising uh, uh, Xi at this point, uh, you know, the, the autonomic response would be, hey, boss, don't do anything. Uh, let, them, let them get more confused. So as long as we continue to, to stutter step and not quite sure what we're doing and don't have a, have a clear response, uh, geez, let that continue uh, while, while we, you know, we, I'm, I'm speaking as if I'm in Beijing, while we continue to to prep, and, and and so so you you get to self yourself into a situation where your uh, relative relative strengths keep improving on your side, and, and then at certain point, uh, perhaps after the Olympics, uh, a la uh, Putin in um, uh, Crimea, uh, then then you can go. One of the things we have not done well as I met, we don't have a grand strategy, nor do we have a great a grand information operations concept that we, sh we should uh, uh, develop, uh, feel. One of the things that I've learned from studying China is they have huge vulnerabilities, which we tend to not highlight, but I think we should, especially regarding uh, what we could do to cause damage. Could the Chinese, uh, could the PRC invite Taiwan? Absolutely. But I think what we've not done well is actually remind the Chinese of the price they're going to pay. Taiwan would make them pay a price, no doubt. But one of the things I learned from a number of things I've done is they have huge vulnerabilities. Say that the People's Republic of China first is fuel, oil. Their economy consumes a great deal of, of Middle East oil. And the moment that is uh, jeopardized, I think they would have to think twice about what they can do. Remember, the modern military to include theirs requires a great deal of, of petroleum to be able to function. And uh, for moving across into Taiwan, that would require a great deal of resources. Uh, they need to be reminded of that. Secondly, their own country, uh, their own population needs protein and it need, they need water, potable water. They, the Chinese government spend a great deal of money on maintaining and expanding resources to keep uh, their population uh, fed and population drinking potable water. Any 
degradation of this could cause huge internal problems, which I'm not against, against creating should the circumstance dictate. So I think we need to be a little bit more bellicose, to be honest with you, with the, our audience, regarding what the consequences would be of Chinese bad behavior. And not, to, not even to mention our allies, the Indians and others coming in to help make uh, this a more credible, I don't wanna say threat, I wanna say a credible response to any Chinese aggression. Uh, we made it very clear during the Cold War what the consequences would be to the Soviets of any aggression. And there was a number of proxy wars which resulted uh, in our following through and making sure the Soviets understood that. I don't think we've done a good job of the Chinese. And let's face it, based on history, any aggressor who is not uh, challenged will continue to be an aggressor and any appeasement would only fuel more quickly their appetite for aggression. And I think that's something we must act on immediately. It is important in understanding this whole scene to take into account what we call China's rise and what that actually has meant and what we need to do. Um, you know, Pete was talking earlier about how the Navy is so important for China. Remember, 25 years ago, they didn't have a Navy. I mean, I used to write editorials about this scene. And one of the things I wrote over and over in the 80s and 90s was they didn't have a blue water Navy. They had a kind of nothing Coast Guard. Um, they now have a Navy. They have a Navy that is ramping up in a ways that are outstripping us. Um, they didn't have and it was, they didn't have the wealth that the country has now. The per capita income in China is nothing great, but compared to what it was 30 years ago, um, I was in there covering Tiananmen in 1989. And one of the things that just stood out at every turn, as these people asked in Beijing, as in China, asked for free speech and freedom and democratic rights was, how poor China was, complete, just beggared under Mao, under communism. Then under Deng Xiaoping, they came up with a form of communism where they stopped having, you know, forced collectivized farms so people could have more efficiently produce. What did not change was the power structure of the Communist Party, was the fundamental idea, principle, ruling principle in China that the Communist Party has, is sort of is above everything, that it commands all. What it wants is the rule. And that has been the case since Mao's revolution in 1949 to this day. It's involved the death of, deaths of scores of millions under Mao. It's involved horrible brutality with things like Tiananmen, what Pete was talking about with in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, what they're doing to destroy the soul of Hong Kong, the threats they're making against Taiwan. And I think if you try to look at it from the point of view of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping of China's rulers, um, they've had great success with this. Uh, Tiananmen, the world said, you know, oh, this is terrible. But what price did China really pay? I think as the Communist Party sees it, the rise, the economic rise of China dates largely from Tiananmen. They shut down the voices of protest and then they just got to work trying to make money. And they did that pretty well. And they have centralized control over things. Look at what they do to any big businessman like Jack Ma, who becomes a potential rival for the Communist Party. They take him down, they take him over. They, only they must have all the power. And Xi Jinping is now, I, I think, I agree with Pete, he could be called emperor. I prefer the title tyrant um, because he's not a nice emperor. This is a terrible, cruel man. And the Nazi model is a place to look for some guidance on what this is and where this goes. And But I think China's Communist Party, its leaders, its rulers, have taken from this rise that they've had the lesson that they are in fact a great model for development. They're entitled to tell the world what to do. If you look at what they do at the United Nations, they offer themselves as this great example. You know, follow us, look what we did, and you can make money too. You can have bullet trains and so forth. Um, what they don't mention when they do this is actually you can get rich and be free. 
In fact, that's the model that's really worked. That's the American model. That was the Hong Kong model. That's the Taiwan model, the one they really want to crush because it shows up China for the China's Communist Party for the lie that it is. Um, that's the model that was all over Asia when I was went out there in the 1980s to cover it. There were these rising countries that were becoming more free as they became more rich, except China. And the thing that one of the things we have got to do to fight back, and this speaks to the terrible cultural problems in America right now, is it is so vital to keep making the argument that to be to get the kind of acquire the kind of wealth that China has been racking up in the last generation or so, you can do that and be free. That the price the Communist Party has exacted for staying in power is they have no freedom. In fact, it's absolutely horrible from everything from they put their late Nobel laureate, Liu Xiaobo, under house arrest for, for after he won the Nobel Prize, because God forbid he should be out there talking to the Chinese people really as an example. Um, you look anywhere, you look at Xinjiang, you look at the simple cruelties of the social credit system they've got now, the incredible surveillance, the claims they make where, yeah, you know, you could ride a bullet train if you're in political grace, but you can't say what you wanna say. You have to look at what happened to the people who spoke out at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, which we haven't even really gotten into, but what China inflicted there on the world with its lies, its cover-up, its gross mendacity, and then its propaganda was horrendously misleading. Probably that began in the Wuhan, the Wuhan lab. We don't know for sure. But however it began, China's handling was, again, signals to the world of how they treat people. You are required to tow whatever line, believe whatever they say, go along with it, whatever they want, Communist Party leadership. And it's that model, the, this China model, which is held out now to Africa, to countries along its Belt and Road, and frankly, to us. Remember all the op-eds we've read about how China is doing so well uh, that needs to be addressed. To put this, just wrap this up in a nutshell, the Chinese Communist Party, in celebrating its 100th anniversary, <laughs> where it should be mourning the scores of millions who died under its rule, in celebrating its anniversary, we'll make no mention of something we need to keep in mind. And that is, okay, China has a lot more money than it did 30 years ago. But as far as human freedoms, rights, respect for the human soul, individual dignity, all these things that are quite compatible with getting wealthy, China is one of the most destitute nations on earth. So that's my... If I could jump in under that, uh, the economic issue for just a very quick second uh, regarding the parallels of Nazi Germany. The, I do recommend people study Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1940 by the very fact that the Nazi regime, the, the, the socialists, the national socialists, di did indeed involve in, uh, themselves in crony capitalism. It wasn't that there was no capitalism. The capitalism was tightly controlled by the central party. Hitler himself and his uh, inner circle were able to manage things like Krupps and other large companies. 13 major companies became subordinated to either the party by the fact that the leaders of those corporations reported the leadership or were replaced by party leadership by party loyalists. So much like China, where corporations exist, if you are not uh, subordinated, subordinating yourself voluntarily to the party, you will be subordinated, as Claudia points out. You will not be bigger than the state. The state will come after you. So I think we need to recognize that this is not a, a, an appropriate uh, free market enterprise. This is essentially a large racket that's designed to enrich the state of, of uh, the, the, the Chinese nation and its party, not the people, and the people uh, like in Germany. Hitler made a number of grand promises, uh, the Volkswagen, everybody's gonna be driving cars and have all these great highways, never happened. All the money that was paid in went away. And I see the same thing here with the Chinese people putting their sweat equity uh, into uh, uh, these corporate enterprises which simply benefit the state. Uh, and I fault US corporations, Nike, uh, Apple and all these other corporations who benefit from Chinese slave labor and prison labor and do, could care less. Uh, and the fact that these U.S. corporations enrich China and ignore the fact that Chinese people are suffering at the hands of 
their government is appalling and something else we do not do well in our own culture by calling out these large corporations for enriching the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, and uh, ignoring uh, what we as Americans would not accept otherwise. If I can uh, uh, dogpile here again, uh, add in uh, a couple of a couple of uh, major facets of, of U.S. society, uh, professional sports and Hollywood, uh, and both are are kowtowing to use that Chinese phrase, uh, kowtowing to Beijing, and and. There's a there's again there's this this horrible uh, but uh, so glaring a a, a, a similarity between uh, uh, the current situation and what happened in Germany. If you remember, those who who will recall that the 1936 uh, Summer Olympics uh, in Berlin, uh, for the first time, the 1932 Olympics were was not a grand spectacle. The 1936 Olympics was turned into a grand spectacle because uh, uh, Goebbels and his good friend, Leni Riefenstahl, put on a show and turned the 1936 Olympics into this global extravaganza in order to uh, stroke uh, Adolf Hitler. And Hitler loved it. And since then, nations have used the Olympics to blow their own horn. And, and frankly, no one has done it quite as well as has the Chinese, uh, just a what was it, was it was it eight years ago for whatever two thousand eight two thousand eight uh, you know take a look at that extravaganza that was the same uh, scale of effort as as you saw in nineteen thirty six uh, and and we're letting them do it again we're letting them uh, 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 essentially dictate the parameters of movies being made in Hollywood we're letting them dictate uh, certain things going on in professional sports. Uh, you know, we're, we're being manipulated. We're talking about China's threat to Hong Kong and Taiwan this episode of Thought to Action. But Japan also sees China as a threat to its national security. What will it take for the nation and its allies, including the U.S., to protect it? If you take a look at some of the southern islands, uh, the, the islands that run on a string south out of Japan, arc down towards Taiwan, the Sinyakus, the Sinyakus, um, uh, it, it would be, it will be very difficult for the Japanese alone uh, to secure those islands if the Chinese were to decide that they're going to occupy them. Uh, some of them are tiny little islands, but there has been this uh, uh, contest of, of words over who controls them. Um, and if the Chinese really wanted them, they have a bigger navy, they have a much bigger navy. Uh, and they have a lot more people, a lot more assets, they certainly could, could see some of those islands. Uh, could the Japanese make it painful? Yeah, sure they could. Uh, could the United States join in and then make it painful? Sure they could. Uh, I, I think the, the problem here though, gets back to uh, a, a much more fundamental issue. And that is clarity in Washington as to what our real uh, overarching grand strategy, our overarching goals are and just exactly what we're willing to do to ensure that our view of what the Western Pacific looks like um, should uh, uh, come through and that the Chinese view uh, is defeated. Um, that, is a, that is a requirement that, that it, that's some thinking that needs to take place in Washington, inside the Pentagon and in the White House. Uh, and they need to do some serious thinking about it. I mean, this is, these, are, these are complex, problems and they could escalate out of control very quickly. Uh, and, and I think we need to we need to hope that there's a whole lot more thinking going on about this kind of thing in the Pentagon. Yes, yeah, so I could think of, jump in very quickly. I can summarize this by essentially saying we need a, a NATO for the region where the equities of all of our allies are examined and put into a comprehensive uh, treaty by the fact that I think others besides us recognize the aggression of the Chinese is going to be a problem. I mentioned earlier, the Chinese have a great need for protein. One of the areas of that's already being challenged is the fishing fleet going out. There's a great competition for fish. Uh, the, the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Filipinos, uh, the, the Vietnamese, all go to the same location, all have large populations which are growing. China recognizes this. So it, it's time that we recognize there's going to be uh, a conflict of nothing else based on resources. Again, uh, India 
and uh, economic competition. Uh, another area uh, that we need to recognize that we don't have to be involved in, but we have to understand. And then if we see benefit of being able to help uh, one side or the other, in this case, the Indians, we should, we ought to do that. But I think this is where we need to be, ha we have, need to have much more serious discussions about how we proceed. Uh, Pete and I are big fans of uh, what, what was called during uh, the between war years, the rainbow plans. Uh, I recently uh, re recognized that General Nimitz, who was the, um, the, the commander of Pacific forces in the Pacific was asked, how did you, how did you know what to do with, with uh, the Japanese to defeat them? He says, oh, we already played all this in war games at the, you know, between uh, the wars. I just basically knew what to do based on a, 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 a series of games I played in, in in the late 20s, early 30s. So we're not doing that. We're not actually go th going through and trying to be deliberate in our thinking of how to deal with this sort of thing. So I think we have to be much more uh, aggressive in our own understanding and trying to game this with our allies of how to to manage uh, the Chinese aggression, which is inevitable at this point. Well, let's hope that uh, that new plan is better than what CETO was. That didn't quite work out so well, now did it? <laughs> Claudia? Yeah, well, let me, what I think you're both saying, and the, the way I put it in quite simple terms is, we need wisdom and backbone, and neither of those is richly in evidence at the moment. Uh, and there are a number of things that have sort of slid by in recent years that I think historians will look back on as quite important. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in hyperbole here, but Vladimir Putin's annexation of Crimea was the first big turf grab since the end of the Cold War. It broke the rules of that international order that said you do not grab your neighbor's territory. That was just this wholesale grab. And while the U.S. administration under Obama huffed and puffed, Russia still has Crimea. He got away with it completely. Um, in fact, he got away with it, especially because in the great zeal by President Obama to pursue an Iran nuclear deal, they needed Russia at the table. They need China at the table for that horrible deal. They shouldn't have it. It's good we were pulled. It's good President Trump pulled us out of it, trying to get us back into it, gets us into all sorts of compromising positions, including with China. So. Crimea. And then what just happened in Hong Kong. It's easy to think, well, it's Hong Kong, it's a city, it was China's turf to begin with, Britain gave it back to them with, you know, there were promises, but no, the important thing to understand about what's just happened in Hong Kong. This is the first real takedown of a mature, democratic, free society. I mean, the society is even if the institutions in Hong Kong were not since World War II. I mean, or at the very least since the Cold War really touched off with the Soviet Union. That is a major precedent. It's not just Hong Kong. It's China saying in your face to the world, we can do this and we'll get away with it. And the penalties have been largely aimed at Hong Kong's administration. I'm, I don't mind that. I think there are a lot of really disgusting people in that administration. They've done bad things, but that's not where the penalty needs to fall. This all comes from Beijing. It's all China. And when China threatens Taiwan and bit by bit starts to increase its incursions into Taiwan's airspace, is building up a military that's clearly aiming to be capable, as Pete said, of executing the invasion if they want to. Um, we sit there and we watch. And it's awfully 1930s, you know, behind me, you'll see a attractively blue covered set of books. I'm not a naval expert. I made my career as a journalist. <laughs> okay, that's, a, that's not a thing to boast about today. But that's um, Samuel Elliott Morrison's history of World War, naval history of World War II. And one of the lines that he puts in an epigraph in those books that I find incredibly a warning and very compelling. He writes about the tendency, he quotes Sophocles, to think, quote, it cannot happen here. Uh, the lesson of history is, oh, yes, it can. And that's what we need, the wisdom, the vision, the will to look up from 
all the quarrels that are now going on in the American streets, the nonsense that's going on in Washington, all that domestic infighting, and look at the real danger, because it's not the climate of the earth that's always been there. It's, it's not all these things we're talking about in culture. America is actually an amazing, vibrant, magnificent society that has produced the best things for the world anyone has ever seen. It's, it's that, it's that we see the real danger rising and we look away and we think it'll be all right. No, we need to, we need to really focus what Tony suggested, what Pete's talking about, we have to stop this the way we wished later we had stopped the rise of Nazi Germany. That's my word on that. Claudia, thank you for joining us uh, on Thought to Action with Pete and Tony. <laughs> and thank all of you for listening and viewing, whichever one you're doing, for this special edition of Thought to Action presented by the London Center for Policy Research. Our first in a series where we address the threat communist China and the CCP pose to its neighbors the U.S., the rest of the world, and of course, please feel free to comment on this video. We would love to hear what you think. Also, subscribe to our channel, and when you do, hit that bell for notifications. Feel free to join our Patreon page where we offer sneak previews and exclusive content like our Ask Us Anything sessions, patreon.com slash thought to action. What would also, what would really help us, not just also, what would really help us to bring this information, this very important information out to the public is if you share the video with your friends, your colleagues, and social media. The YouTube algorithm is not usually friendly to us or anyone like us while exposing issues like what we discussed here. Also, find more about the London Center for Policy Research on our website, londoncenter.org.